So first, let's get our setup done. Before we start building the Streamlit app, you need to install Streamlit on your local system. So you, you can use Conda and install. Once so you install Streamlit, you will have the Streamlit binary that is available on your computer, which you can use to develop the apps. Once the setup is done, you can start building the apps. The, the way the structure of the app is we're going to have a folder with some Python files. And those Python files are considered of our app. Most apps, if unless your app is really complex, will just have one file. And by convention, you call that file app.py. You can call it anything you want, but by convention, only when you see a streamlit app, you say, where is the app.py? That's the main file that you want to execute. You can have other Python files that are called from different files, but most apps will just be a single file containing all the Python code. So we'll create those files. One of the downsides of streamlit is that you need to use an editor and your local terminal for development. You cannot do your development in a notebook. That's the reason there are other frameworks that have come up, which allow you to do development like Streamlit inside of a notebook, but Streamlit doesn't allow you, to, allow you to do that. So we'll have to kind of go back and start writing code in an editor. For doing this, you need to have an editor. Any text editor will work. We recommend it. You, unless you use an editor, you can keep using this. If you don't use an editor, you can download Notepad++ on Windows or TextMate on Windows on Mac. Those are both good free editors. You need a text editor, don't use Notepad and Windows. It causes all sorts of issues with that. So make sure you have an editor and a place to put the files. Let's just create a place where we can put our code. I'm gonna use my desktop. Feel free to use any locations. Desktop is simple, you can navigate to that. So let's just first open our file navigator, a file explorer on Windows or a finder on Mac and create a folder named simple underscore dashboard on your desktop. So I'm going to open my desktop and I'm going to just create a new folder and I'm going to name it simple underscore dashboard. So I've created this folder on my desktop. It could be anywhere, but you know, keep it a place where you can find through command line. So you need to know the path to where you put the command. Once we create it, let's create a file inside of this. So start your editor whichever editor you prefer, use TextMate. So I'm going to start my editor. We'll just create, open our editor and create our first file. I'm going to put a few lines of code here. The code says import streamlit as st, st.title, a simple dashboard, st.write, the dashboard displays a chart. So we just give a title to the app and put in some text. We'll just this is just to test if our app is working and we can continue the development. So open your text editor, whichever editor you have chosen, put this text and then save this file inside the folder. So we want to save this file inside of the folder, simple dashboard, and we will name this file app.py. Make sure you save it as app.py, not app.py.txt. If you use notepad on Windows, it'll add this TXT extension. So make sure you know, you're using a real editor, which allows you to configure the extensions and it should be called app.py, nothing else. So the first step we did was create a folder somewhere where we can access on our computer. We chose desktop and inside desktop, we had a simple dashboard, put app.py here, put some code here. You can copy paste this from the web page here, just a basic framework for our app, just to test if it works. The third step is to open a terminal and run this app using the Streamlit library that we installed. So let's open a terminal. On Linux and Mac, you can open a terminal. On Windows, you can open the Anaconda prompt. Make sure it's Anaconda prompt and not Anaconda PowerShell prompt. Just use the basic prompt. So you can open the command prompt. If you've installed Anaconda, it should display the environment name here. So if you open the Anaconda prompt on Windows, it should start at the base environment. We have installed Streamlit in an environment called Streamlit. So let's activate it. So we'll say conda space activate space Streamlit. And this will switch our environment to Streamlit. This is the place where we have installed Streamlit and we have Streamlit library available here. Open a terminal and type conda activate streamlit. This is the step three. So we opened 
a terminal. You can see it's Anaconda prompt on Windows. It was in base environment. We do Conda activate streamlet. And then we have to switch to the directory where we have installed. Most of the time when you open the terminal, you are in the home directory. We have to go to the folder where we have the app.py. In my case, I had put this on my desktop. So we'll say use the CD command and say CD space desktop. You can use tab to autocomplete. This also helps you make sure you're in the correct place. So if you go to desktop and simple dashboard, I sh I'm now inside of this directory. On Linux and Mac, I can do ls to see that my app.py is there. On Windows, I can do dir. If I just do dir, it should show app.py. This is the hardest step for most people, especially on Windows. Sometimes your desktop is not in your desktop. It's in your, you know, Microsoft OneDrive. So to find the path to that and figure out. So make sure you put it somewhere that's on your computer and you can navigate to it. Once you are in the directory with the app.py, this is now you can run and preview our app. So you have to say streamlit space run app.py. Streamlit space run space app.py. As I click enter, it's going to open a new tab and it displays the app that we've created. The app that we created is very simple right now. It just has a title and some text. And this is what we are able to do this. You need to keep this tab open. This is, you need to keep this terminal open because this is serving this app to your local server. This is a local server serving the app to your browser. And once the browser tab opens, this is where you are set and we can go to the next step. Let's look at the Streamlit documentation. So this is the main documentation of Streamlit. So the docs tab is where the documentation is there. We can learn about what are the different stuff we can add to our app. We have the API reference. These are the different elements you have. You have stuff to write stuff. You have data, you can do charts, inputs. So you have buttons and other things, checkbox. You have, you can display image or video can do layouts, you can do columns or, you know, hide stuff or have a sidebar, etc., and a bunch of other things. So let's just do write some data. First, we'll try to display some pandas data frame. We're going to try and load the pandas data frame and see how it looks like. We have the data element here, st.data frame. So st.data frame will display a data frame as a table useful for data scientists. Like we have always working data frames. If you just want to display this in your app, you can use this element to display this. First, let's get some data. So I'm going to go to my app here and we're going to get some data. So we're going to uh, construct the URL. So I have my data URL here and we have the CSV file. So we have this file hosted on GitHub somewhere. You can say, I have this URL that I want to use. You can download it and use it or pandas can read a URL directly. So I can just say, I want to use pandas and read this. So I'll say import pandas as PD. Pandas comes pre-installed with streamlit. You don't need to install it separately. So we can just say pd.readcsv from this URL and I get my data frame. And once I have this data frame, I can want to display this, I can use ST data frame. So I can say ST.data frame df and it'll display. I want to explain what happens when you run this app. When the, when the app runs, it starts from the top. It goes here, creates the title, creates this text, fetches the data and creates the data frame. It, the order of the element matters. If I put this data, ST data frame before, the data frame will be displayed first. So your layout is sequential. So we have to do the layout according to in the order of the it happens. I realized in the copy pasting, there's an extra space before this data. URL. make sure you remove the data space when you copy this. But once I've done, I can say, hit save. I've saved my file. Go back to the app. It says source file changed. You want to read on the app. You can also choose always read on. That means every time you save your file, your app will automatically update. And this makes for a very pleasant development experience. You change something and you can see the changes on the app immediately. So when you get prompted for doing this, you can always say always read on. And it says my app is running and it should display a data frame. Python is very sensitive to spaces, so make sure you don't have spaces appropriately. And once you have this, save it, go back to the tab that it's open, you'll be prompted, choose always read and, and then next time you make some changes, your app will auto update. When I change something, let's say I want to have some interactive element, I said change the drop down or do anything. Every time I make a change, my whole app will run again. 
So this is a streamlit model. Let's say I want to add more line here. So I'm just, don't do this yet. I'm just going to show you the concept. So I'm going to add another line saying that this is a new line. Okay. And I save it. You can see my app is running from top to bottom. It's creating this, it's fetching the data again and creating this. If I have a drop down and I select change the drop down, it'll fetch the data again. So every time I do something with app, I'm fetching the data again. It's not a big problem for this file because it's a very small file. But what if you're fetching, say, 50 MB GeoJSON? You don't want to fetch this every time the user moves around the map. So if you are fetching data or if you're creating a database connection, what if you're creating a database connection? Every time you change an app, you will create a new connection. You don't want that. So this is the stuff that you want to keep it persistent across the app runs. You have to put this inside a function and cache that. So you say when we are loading the data, this code should run only once. So this part, when you fetch the data and create a data frame, that should run only once. And next time you call the function, it says the data is already there. I'm not going to rerun that. So first I'm going to create a function. I'm going to write a function called load data. You can pass some arguments saying that, you know, maybe let's say you have a database and say load data for this country. And only if you call the function again with the new data, it's going to go and fetch the data. But if you call a function with the same argument, it says I already done that before. So I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to put this inside of the function. So I'm going to indent it in Python indentation determines what's inside of the function. And now I'm going to just say return df. So when I call this function, I'll get the data frame. I'll just say, I'll call this function once. So now I get my data frame. So my app will run, say load data and display this. Next time when I update the app or do something else, I don't want this data to be fetched again. So I will add this decorator called st.cache data. This is called a decorator in Python. Anything that starts with an at, you put this above a function. Decorator will modify the behavior of this function. So what this says is this function is now cached. Whenever you call the function, it will not run. It'll go to Python first. It says, have I run this function before? If yes, I already have the data and it'll just return the data it has. If it doesn't have the data, it's not run the function. It's going to go and fetch the data and then save it locally. So the next time you run the function, it's going to cache that. So Python uses something called pickling to store the cache data. A pickling is a way to take some data and store it on disk. And any object that can be pickled in Python and stored on disk can be cached. So you're limited by amount of disk space you have on the place where you're running the app. So on the server that you are hosting the app, if you have one GB of storage, you can cache one GB of data. So whatever storage you have. Right now you have whatever storage you have on your computer, you'll be able to use that. Let's do something else. Instead of displaying just data frame, I want to do something else like this. I'm going to create a ST select box. I'm going to put it in a drop down. So let's go to our Streamlit documentation and we want to get a select box. A select box is a drop down where you have different drop down values inside of the app. You say st.select box, bunch of options. And here, essentially, you can give a list of options. So you can say the name of the select box, say choose something, and then options, list of values that you can give, and those will be displayed in the drop box. So just to sh show how it works, I can just say st.select box and say select a value, and then I need to give a list. So I'll say I want A and B. Save. You can see I have a drop down here and I have A and B. So this is how I could create the Dropbox. What I want to do is I want to now load the name of all the districts inside the Dropbox. So I have a data frame. I can say, give me all the values in this column and put all of those in the dropdown. So I can use that as something to, for the user to select which district you want to see. Okay. So let's remove this data frame and in, we'll build a dropdown where we'll put all the district names here. We just say, I have my data frame. The district column is called districts. You can access the column either through a dot notation or through the indexing notation, and this is called dot values. So I have this list of districts, and I can put this here. And now you can see I have my drop down, which has all the names. So I could read some data. And from the data frame, I could load this on my list here. 
So let's try this out. Let's update our code. The second piece of code that you need is also available here. So let's go and copy paste the code that's available here. If you are if you're coding along with it, make sure you add the pandas import and you do the function with the decorator and then use this. Otherwise you can just copy paste this function, this code from the step seven here. And once you save it, you should see the drop down menu the list here. Moving on to the next step. This is kind of the most important stream bit concept to wrap your head around. I have a select box. If I interact with it, let's say I change my input to a different value. What happens? How do I take that and do something with it? In many F frameworks, you say, okay, I have this object. I have user interacted with it. I'll trigger a function and do something. In Streamlit, all objects that you created, when select changes, you say, I'll save the value here. So let's say I have this value district, which is the currently selected district here. So let's say when the app starts, I have this value district is selected. So currently the district variable will contain the value welcome. As I interact with the app, so I change the thing, Streamlit will read on my entire script. So I'll go from top to bottom. It'll run this, load the data, and it says, oh, the user selected currently Bangalore. So my district becomes Bangalore. I don't have to code the behavior. I don't have to say, oh, when it's changed, update that. Stream will read on everything, and the district variable will be the currently selected value. If I change this, my variable will change. And I want to show that if I just let this put the district. So let's say st.text, I'll put here currently selected. And we're just going to say district. So if I change this, you can see this district variable always will refer to the currently selected value. If I change this, I know what the user selected. So now my app becomes very simple. As I say, I have the variable, which always will show me the currently selected district and I can do something with it. So let's say we have, we now know what is the currently selected district in this district variable. We can apply a filter on the data frame. We say, just select the row for the district. We have this column national highways and state highways. We'll create some plot. So if I say st.dataframe, let me just show you the filtered one. So if I change my district, it shows filters the data frame to this row and saying I have NH value and SH value. So I want to create a plot, a bar graph showing that this is the length of national highways in this district and what length of national highways. So I want to take this filtered data frame and display a chart. I can use my matplotlib skills to create my chart. So same concept. We use matplotlib, so I'm going to import matplotlib here. I take my matplotlib and say, create a subplot. I have an axis and a figure, and we'll take our data frame, plot it as a bar chart, give two different colors, and do some labels, turn off my X labels, and now I have a plot. I have this figure, and Streamlit has a support for displaying a matplotlib plot. That is an st.py plot. So I want to display this figure. Save. And oh, I have a typo here. So now I have a chart. And if I change this, the chart changes because as I'm changing this, the variable district is changing. My filter data frame is changing. My new chart gets created, which gets displayed here. So just like that, we were able to create a visualization which auto updates. Try this out. Let's do the next step here. This is your step number eight. So once you do step number eight and save it, you should see a chart. If you're doing this, make sure you're importing the mat.lib in the previous script. And you can customize this chart however you like. Right? Now, everything we learned in our first module, you can use it here. You can create any kind of chart and display this on your app. This is what we have done so far. We have drop down that is driving our chart, and we could code this. Let's just learn about some other elements that Streamlit provides that you can use. We have a huge variety of components that you can use inside of Streamlit. So go and check out all the stuff that is supported here. There are stuff that you may not even know that it's available. So I wanted to show something that's different and maybe you might use this in your app. There is a something called a color picker, which allows you to select a color. So when you're creating maps or charts, colors are important. Maybe you made a choice for the user, but the user wants to see the output in a different color. Maybe you have users with some visual disability and they want to choose the colors that are appropriate for them. So you can allow the users to pick their own colors for the charts and maps that you create. It's again, very simple, say st.colorPicker and they can use the color picker. So we want to create a color picker like this 
where you can let the user pick the national highway color and the state highway color because we have two bars so they can pick each color what they want also so first let's see how we can use that so back to our code we want to add some color picker right after we display our district tick box or select box so we do it here let's say we will do st dot color picker and we'll say pick our color and we'll display some default color. So we'll say this will start with this default color of this red, green, blue. It's a hexadecimal code for that. So let's just use that. If I save it, you can see I've got a color picker widget. So just by creating this, we could get a color picker. I can create another one and maybe I have a different color for that. I get another color picker. So I can have this color picker. Now, if I add stuff to it after each line, all the elements are organized in rows. So I'll keep adding stuff to this. But I want them to be organized in columns. Just, you know, I want them to be horizontal for this. The rest, all the elements can be done in a horizontal layout. So we want to have them in different layouts. So for layout, we can use this thing called ST columns. We can design a layout where you have multiple columns and put stuff inside of these columns. You can say, I have this idea. I want to divide into two columns. The first column, something goes, second column goes something. So you can have different columns side by side. Let's just change our code and use this on our app. So I'm going to just say st.columns and we'll just say, I want two columns. You'll get two objects. So you'll get a list of columns that you can use to do something. I'll just say call one and call two. So these are the two columns that you get. And now instead of saying st.colorPicker, I'll say call1.colorPicker and call2.colorPicker. And you can see it now changed. Similarly, if you can add a sidebar, and when you have a sidebar, you can say sidebar.colorPicker, sidebar. and it will go into sidebar. So there's a slight different syntax where instead of doing st of that widget, you can take the layout element that you have and add the color picker to it. I want the user to change it. So let's say I the user change this to this color. How do I get this color? Well, I can just save the value here. So I'll just say this will be my SH color. And this will be my NH color. So whatever user selects will be saved into this variable. Similar to how Streamlit works. As soon as you have input widget, as soon as the user interacts with it, the variable will save the value of the user selection. And I'll just say, pick an NH color, and pick an SH color. Okay. So now I have a variable which says this is an NH color and this is an NH color. So now instead of having this values as a list of colors, which I have defined, I've kind of hard coded it. I'll just say, use the NH color and the SH colors that we have. Now what will happen is if I change this to let's say a different color, the bar changes. What happened? I selected this, changed it, the whole app read in, and it says, oh, I need to create this plot. What's the color? SH color has the latest selected value. This is such an easy way to code a color picker where you can allow the users to do this. And I encourage you to do this if you, because in mapping, we have different color palettes, etc. You can give people a choice of color palettes or different colors so they can apply their own instead of you deciding for them. One of the things that you may see is when you have same type of multiple widgets and you want to kind of differentiate them, you can add this key thing. So you do this right now, it's not needed, but sometimes you'll see code which uses this key parameter to just say, this one color picker is NH, this one is SH. It kind of keeps them separate. Let's try this out. You can take the code from step number nine. So step number nine has the, the full code. You can copy the whole thing and see the final app in action. Okay, so we're done with our first app. We have created the simple dashboard. Let's do an exercise. So once we have the app, let's practice some of the streamlit components and how it works. Let's do an exercise. Vigna, you can explain the next exercise. So for the exercise here, uh, we want user to have an option to have this chart in the unit of miles or kilometers. 
so here we have one more column like we can have one more column like this so we can just add one more column here so you have already two columns for picking up the color now have one more for the radio button here and uh, you have this formula to convert your kilometers to miles so after having a radio button you will have to save it in a variable maybe say unit and then you can apply your condition for that whether the unit is miles the things like this label and conversions should happen as well as this things should be changed so put it all in the condition and then try to do the script so here uh, i think you can try with keeping it a y label as y or something and in the condition you can put say put it as miles so that it will just pick pick from the variable if that condition applies. Yeah, so try to create this. Uh, so you can just take this example. It, is, it will be easier. So you see the syntax of this and what it gives. So you can use this for your reference and you can create a radio button with two options, miles and kilometer. So for the app, this is the output that we expect. You need to have a third column where you have a radio box, radio button with two options, kilometers and miles. The user says kilometer, your chart will display the data in kilometers. If it's miles, you have to change this label as well as the values that you plotting with the conversion. So we have some hints given here on how you can do the conversion and how you can implement that.